This video is dedicated to Ron Graham, a mathematician who in his 60s could do a triple somersault on a trampoline. He's also served as president of the International Jugglers Association, and he's even appeared on stage with Cirque du Soleil. I didn't know about any of this until recently when I heard of his passing. I've since found out a lot about him, mostly from this page, maintained by Fan Chung Graham, Ron's fellow mathematician and wife. I wish her and their family the very best in this new phase of their lives. As a mathematician, Ron has contributed a lot. His contributions range from deep insights to fun results. This video is about one of his fun results. But before we get to that, I'd like to take five minutes to talk about some other contributions of his that I have been fascinated by. The most popular of these is probably Graham's number. He came up with this number in order to help explain a proof that he had a part in proving. The number itself is famous because of how absolutely ridiculously large it is. The large numbers that we generally come across, like astronomically large numbers, can be expressed with exponentiation. Just by changing the exponent from a hundred to a million, we go from a hundred digit number to a million digit number. You wouldn't try writing that number directly without exponentiation. But we can make this crazier if we allow the exponent itself to be expressed using exponentiation. Things really start getting ridiculous when we repeat this process. Take this number. You can pause this video if you want to think about how large it is. We call this a power tower of height 10. And here when we change 10 to 100, the number becomes incredibly large. But you wouldn't try expressing Graham's number as a simple power tower either. It's too large to be expressed so simply. But we can do another ridiculous step to get an even more ridiculous operation. We can repeatedly power tower the way we repeated exponentiation. We take the value of the power tower and make that the height of a new power tower and repeat this process. And we can get even more ridiculous operations than this by repeating this new operation as well. Graham's number is actually defined by making a ridiculous enough operation. But how ridiculous is ridiculous enough? Well, the number of times we'd need to make the operations more ridiculous is itself a number too large to be expressed easily. To express that number, we need to use ridiculous operations again. This just scratches the surface of how large Graham's number is, although it does introduce the necessary concepts. Look it up if you want a better picture of how large it is. Then there's the Graham scan. It's a simple and efficient algorithm that lets a computer find the outermost points among a set of points on a plane. It's an easy task for us to do, and it's useful for a computer to be able to do it too. Remember that the computer just sees the points as a pair of coordinates and doesn't really see the plane like we are seeing it. The Graham-Pollock theorem is a statement about how many colors are needed to color the edges of a graph in a particular way. It has many elegant proofs, but weirdly none of them look like a proof about graphs. My favorite proof of it looks at the structure that's required from the question and changes it to a question about equations that has the exact same structure, and then it easily solves the new question. I know that's really vague, so maybe I should make a video about it. I'll think about it. He also co-authored this book, which showcases some really beautiful and intriguing mathematics. And this other book, which I haven't yet read. I really should, though. His list of contributions goes on, even birthing entire areas of research. But the contribution that today's video is about is a simple question about addition. Let's take a look. Let's start with an arbitrary number. We can transform this number using addition. Since we have no plus signs here, the transformation does nothing. Depending on where we put plus signs, it can get transformed to various numbers. The largest number it can transform to is itself when we don't put any plus signs. And the smallest number it can transform to is the sum of all its digits. You can verify this for yourself. The question we want to answer is this. Given a number, how many transformations are needed 
to reach a single digit number. In this case, we can reach a single digit number in three steps. But there might be a more clever way to put pluses so that we reach a single digit number in two steps. Let's look at some small numbers and see how many steps they need. Every single digit number needs zero steps. 10 is the first number to need one step. 10 to 18 can all be done in one step. A first attempt at 19 seems to require two steps. But since there is no other way to put plus signs, 19 does indeed require two steps and is the first such number. To find a number requiring three steps, we need to make sure that the sum of its digits is not less than 19. Because if it were, it could reach there in one step and then finish in one more step. So what's the first number whose digits add up to 19? The first such number is 199. And so the naive attempt would yield three steps. There is a more clever way to insert plus signs though. So 199 only requires two steps. What's the next number whose digits add up to 19? It's 289. And in this case, no matter how you put plus signs, you need three steps. Let's try to put all this together and see what number would require four steps. So here's what we know. 1 is the first number to require 0 steps. 10 is the first number to require 1 step. 19 is the first number where the naive solution requires 2 steps. And there's no other solution, so 19 does require 2 steps. 199 is the first number where the naive solution requires 3 steps. But here there is a better solution, and 289 turned out to be the first number which actually requires three steps. So what about four steps? We know that if the sum of digits is less than 289, it can reach there in one step and finish in two more steps. So what is the first number whose digits sum up to 289? That would be this 33 digit number. This number is still doable in two steps though. So whichever number is the first to require four digits is larger than this number. Let's just put this entry as at least 10 to the power 32. In case there are clever ways to go about adding, this number could be much larger than 10 to the power 32. And this is where Ron Graham comes in. He, along with Steve Butler and Richard Stong, wrote a paper titled Inserting Plus Signs and Adding. In this paper, they give a clever way to reach single-digit numbers quickly and improved the 10 to the power 32 to infinity. That's right, every single number can reach a single-digit number in just three steps. And it's not even a complicated proof, so we have got to see how this is possible. Choose a number, any number, well, any positive integer. Okay, I don't know what number you chose, but I'm still going to write it down, like this. A0 is the digit in the units place, A1 in the tens place, and so on. We are going to look at three ways to insert plus signs. One is the usual sum of all digits. The second and third are the double digit sums. Since there are two possible double digit sums depending on where you start inserting the plus signs. Let's start with the first sum. We already know that if it is less than 289, the number requires at most three steps. So from now on, we'll assume that this sum, which we'll call m, is at least 289. The next step in the proof is to note that one of these double digit sums is much larger than m. This is quite easy to do actually. Let's add the two double digit sums and see what we get. The A0 digit appears twice, both in the units place, so that contributes two times A0. The A1 digit appears twice, one in the units place and once in the tens place, so that contributes 11 times A1. 
the A2 digit also appears twice, once in the tens place and once in the units place. So it contributes 11 times A2. In fact, every digit apart from A0 appears once in the units place and once in the tens place. So we have 11 times the sum of all digits except A0 plus twice A0. Since A0 is a small part of the sum, this is roughly 11 times the whole single digit sum. Let's state that mathematically. We know the sum is 11 times m minus a0 plus twice a0, or 11 times m minus 9 times a0. Since a0 is a single digit and can't be larger than 9, we are subtracting at most 81. And since we are assuming that m is much larger than 81, 11m minus 81 is larger than 10m. So the sum of the double digit sums is larger than 10m. So at least one of them has to be larger than 5m. This will be crucial. The single digit sum is m, and one of the double digit sums is at least 5m. To see why this is useful, let's take a large number where m is at least 289. Let's see its three relevant sums and find out which double digit sum is 5 times m. Oh, it looks like both of them are. Now let's plot the single digit sum on the number line. We are going to transition from the single digit sum to one of the double digit sums. So the sum arrow will start at m and eventually end to the right of 5m. One thing to notice is that the sum moves slowly. Let's analyze how slowly it moves. Our next change will be changing 8 plus 7 to 87. The only difference between the two is that 8 started in the units place and ended in the tens place. So the sum increases by 9 times 8 and the maximum increase would be 9 times 9, or 81. In steps of size at most 81, the arrow moves from m and ends to the right of 5m. Let's take advantage of this. Let's call a region good if it has length 81 and it is full of numbers which can reach a single digit number in two steps. Since the sum moves in jumps of at most 81, if it has to cross such a region, it will have to land inside it. For instance, 1000 to 1080 is a good region. No number in that region has its single digit sum larger than 17, so they can reach a single digit in two steps. And as you can see, our sum arrow has to cross it to reach past 5m. Let's fast forward to the jump. And there we go, it has landed inside the region. Up on top, we have a way of inserting plus signs into our number so that in two more steps, it reaches a single digit number. And this good region works for a wide variety of starting numbers. If you have any number whose single digit sum is 496, this trick works for it. Let's see some other values of m for which this region works. For an m as small as 200, the arrow will have to jump into this region. And even if m is as large as 999, or even a bit larger than that, the arrow will at some point be in this region. So we've covered values of m between 200 and 1000. For other values of m, we can find other good regions. For m between 1000 and 2000, the region 2000 to 2080 works. From 2000 to 10,000, the region 10,000 to 10,080 works. And this pattern continues, covering all possible values of m. Feel free to pause this and convince yourself. And that's it, the proof is done. For any number, if the single digit sum is smaller than 289, it can reach in three steps. 
if it's as large as 289, then we're guaranteed to find a way to insert plus signs so that it lands in a region from which it takes only two more steps. So those can also be done in three steps. As they say in their paper, the speed of insert and add is unexpected and can be used to surprise and amaze your friends and colleagues. I hope that some of the viewers will go on to do exactly that. I learned about this question from this blog post by RJ Lipton, a computer scientist. You can check it out if you want to. The picture of the graph that I used for graham pollock theorem was taken from Wikipedia. It was uploaded by David Epstein, who also happens to be a computer science professor. And his contributions page on Wikimedia is a treat for the eyes. Of course, I owe a lot of gratitude to Grant Sanderson, the mathematician behind the YouTube channel 3Blue1Brown and behind the animation software that I used. Thank you all for watching and have a great day.